So today, uh, I'm going to be moderating and the panelists up here. The panel is diversity inclusion, creative, innovating, and creative mission data and metrics. So I have Ben Foster, my right, uh, consultant at the Scale Factory. We have Emma Irwin, who is open project and community specialist. I have Sean Geigens, who's an associate professor at the University of And I have uh, Jesus. No, we're, we're Emma was just suggesting we center just ourselves. We're, we're sort of skewed to the right in order to find where we're on. Okay, we're we're skewed to the right. We're, we're unbalanced. Dashboard. 
metrics as they're in your menu. These are all the things that you can see. But that dashboard is generally not useful beyond whatever the story is that you're trying to tell. So this tool auger that we've been building is kind of a Frankenstein. We use pieces of more lab, we use pieces of facade, which is a Samsung project, because they all pull in different kinds of data and let us make them available to you. And uh, I think probably from a how people make use of it perspective, the two things that we're doing right now, the chaos project is making all those data endpoints available via an API so you can build your own front end of them. And our front end contains data comparisons so you can compare projects. People don't reason about metrics, I think, in a dashboard, but they can reason about projects that they're familiar with and look at a project they're not familiar with and contrast to a project they're familiar with and, and see the difference. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing part because uh, Daniel is here, who is the person who is more involved in the diversity of the chaos on the campus, or the part that we don't know him. But they've been involved in the uh, diversity and inclusion stand in the global resource of this is many years ago. You said participation in the single largest uh, uh, survive of diversity on the solver that was supplied by the and uh, my concern with this, I started to uh, not be one, but realize that there were there are chains in the world where people listen to just our free software, but they are not represented in the free software community at all, like South America, for instance. And what happens with this? Because uh, the relationship between the interest and the knowledge of people in the lobbying and so on, and the participation in the open source community is, is way not only from the gender of the view, which is, of course, but also from the traffic of the view, from the language of the view, from the people of the view, and even from the age of the view. So I, I started to become concerned with this, and since I'm working in metrics, I'm specifically interested in finding out metrics that can tell you when there is a specific group, which for some reason is underrepresented, or it's not, let's say, deal with the right way within a community. And that happens with many, many different kinds of so I think it's never pointed out. Yeah, I work in this industry. Yes, right. Exactly. Um, so could you talk about uh, the implications of this work? The problems that might stem from this work, complexities that stem from this work. You know, get into a little bit of detail there. It's kind of an open question, but I'll, I'll pose it to Emma. So, right on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's actually a good segue because my workshop in South Africa will be exploring this very topic. So. Okay, um, I, th I think um, as we get into thinking about the dem demographics, right, and we're looking at how many you know, non male contributors do we have in our community, um, how do we think about Socioeconomic status, like how do we understand that? Is that access to, to you know, the internet? Is it um, age groups? Um, how do we ensure that people who are caregivers or parents or you know, like there's there's so many demographics. How do we first of all like ensure that we're asking those questions for the right reasons? We're not just asking them because let's just put this on our dashboard so people can see, like you know, that we we actually are being intentional. So I think. Intentionality and like it's super important. And I don't think we're there yet. In my workshop is sort of draw from your brains around what that means to you. Um, the ethics, so that's I think mostly kind of what I'm trying to say. And then consent. So you know, uh, there's a we're looking at um, like if someone gives their their personal identifying information, like their email address, and they have you know information on the internet about themselves, including their gender, is it is it okay that because it's publicly available, we can go and scrape that and create this profile around demographic? And, and I, I feel like if I ask that person, they might say, well, I'd really like to give consent before you do that. These are all the questions I'm not saying that I have the answers to, them, but I think that they're really important questions as we, as we like, move forward in this, that we're really empathetic in why we're doing this. Um, and I, you know, I know there's financial, you know, we know that diversity improves innovation, we know that 
ensure a participation cost study on top of all of this, but that ultimately the center of why we're doing this is, is about the model. Yeah, so those are all the things I think about. Yeah. In, in the work I do, it's mostly numbers, and I think how it affects diversity and inclusion or why it's related is there is no, I don't think numbers are the decision. I don't think any of them, I'm sorry, I don't think metrics or has to have um, objectivity. They're not objective. They are precise, the degree of precision, the degree of accuracy, but I don't think there's objectivity in the metrics. And I think sometimes we as human beings fall into a trap of thinking because it's quantitative, it's objective. And we're making all kinds of choices about what we present and how we use those numbers to tell a story. And so the idea that when I deploy a metric that has objectivity, I think is one of the things that keeps, it keeps people stuck in the way that things currently work. And, and so having a perspective where we can step back and say, okay, these, these metrics have value, but what, how do we want to use them? And how does the way that we use them affect these concerns like diversity? Yeah, I mean, I think that's too, that one of the challenges with, the, with diversity and inclusion in general is that there are a lot of things that, that we can't really measure, but that could have a huge influence, you know, influence on inclusion. So things like, you know, a, a evening events that are based entirely around alcohol. And there are lots of people who, for whatever reason, don't drink. And do they do they choose to be um, to go to that event anyways? Do they choose to stay at home because they aren't interested in participating in that particular culture? And that's something we don't really think of, and it can actually have a huge impact on things like diversity and inclusion in a project. And there are lots of little things like that, so you know, the language we use, so using things like technical or non-technical to refer to people who do reasonably technical work, it just happens to not be software engineering, it happens to be more on the maybe documentation side or some of the other things. And how does the language that we use influence diversity and inclusion? But you can't really, you can't really measure those. Right? You can't really, you don't know why the person stayed home for the event. <coughs> because, they, because they were sick, just because they didn't like it, because of alcohol focused. And so there are a lot of, just, I think, really subtle things that are really difficult or possibly impossible to measure, but that we need to think about in many ways. I have the idea that we're not going to measure it, to know what the demographics of the community is. You know, for instance, how many males and females are there, and that we can have. But we still don't have tools for metric to find for now we require. And uh, let me just an example. When you have a community with a uh, small representation of any group and you want to increase that one, it could be in one of two situations. Maybe the project is not attractive enough for that community for any person. Or maybe the project is attractive, but once people from that community came into it, they are created by uh, I don't know, social issues of the of the group, for instance. It's pretty difficult right now to make it but from the point of view of policy, they are really, really different. Because if you are not attractive enough, you need to put policies in place to attract people, right? But if you are attracting people to a project which is not interesting, what basically is going to happen is that people are going to camp and they are going to get rejected, and that's even even worse than going to get developed. So my feeling is that we are needing metrics for those cases, for those situations, where it's not only saying this community is biased by uh, gender, for instance, bad. This community is biased because of this and this, and this is the things that they need to improve. First, and I think that we need to work more of it. And of more of it. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I think you guys spot on a lot of really interesting things about um, inclusion in general. And I think uh, I, I thought you made a really great point about uh, that that's often overlooked. That uh, I, mean, I I love alcohol, but like sometimes I don't want to drink. And if I'm going to an event where I know that there's going to be a lot, a lot there, it's sometimes it's discouraging for me to attend. Um, one of the things that some of what out was about caregiving, and I, I think that we focus a lot of times, whether intentionally or unintentionally, on women being the role of the caregiver, uh, and I think enabling moms to work. And I think one of the, what my opinion is that one of the ways we can do that is enabling dads to work too. And so by by saying that, I say that it, the burden isn't just on women to be caregivers, but how do we enable that? Uh, how do we enable that in a way that we're not saying that you have to be a mom 
and a worker, you could just be a part of a team that's a caregiver and also be an employee. How do we how do we kind of shift that narrative away from just saying that only women have the responsibility for caregiving to a, a more broad audience, a more more diverse group? Do you mean caregiving in the context of the family unit or caregiving in the context of the health resources? Uh, the, the family unit in general. Okay. Yeah, I mean, when I think about caregiver role, um, and that could be child care, that could be infants, that could be elder care, that could be you know, some of the hospice, some of some, in the, the contribution that Don's like, are we recognizing people who have less about time to eat? Do you still like turn out and give us quality contributions, or are we just rewarding people that have a lot of time? You know, so a lot of times I think more about like that 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 hands on and not specifically necessarily the healthcare. I think it comes from a well intentioned place of saying you should enable women to also be caregivers, but I think it, it ignores the fact it, it kind of implicitly puts this burden on women to be only the only caregiver as opposed to saying, hey, it's okay if you're not necessarily. Know what you're talking about, how to shift that narrative. This is a little bit sideways, like just popping in my head, so it might be wrong or misguided, but it seems to me that open source provides anyone in a family caregiving role an opportunity to do work and not have to be in a specific place at a specific time. So you can earn a living in open source work ostensibly from whatever time zone and place that, that you exist in and you have a schedule that you're able to work on. And in, in that respect, Huge opportunity to tap a market of people who do work that are presently not engaged in open source. That you know, if I'm a if I'm a stay-at-home mom, which you to know a lot of people do, I'm a dude, but putting myself into that role, now I you know if, if the open source community finds a way to make these opportunities to do this work more welcoming to me than, than I might feel right now, then but there's a huge it's just a huge labor pool as well as a huge opportunity to sort of demonstrate uh, multiple caregiving identities. And, you know, it's an opportunity. I mean, the other thing is, God, we just have to do more caregiving than men. Um, oh, I just have to. Oh, that's what Yeah, it, uh, uh, kind of really a back and forth metric. Like, I wonder if companies that really allow remote workers, because certainly they're. Um, I see lots of job descriptions in my feed and people send stuff around that says like, we want you to move to San Francisco, um, which is stupid for lots of reasons, but probably for that reason. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that place is gonna sink into the ocean, I'm pretty sure. Um, but you know, but the, the sort of, the way that we could look at it from a metrics perspective is, uh, and uh, that I think would be interesting is to see if companies uh, that insist when you move into San Francisco um, are more likely to end up with like white men that want to live in a bunk bed situation in San Francisco, <laughs> or if you know, and if companies that say like, hey, we don't care, like live where you already live and do your hours more flexibly, like if those companies actually see more women staying for longer as employees and more and or more people that are acting in caregiving role. Like, I, I can't even fathom moving your grandma to San Francisco. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's so, like, I would, uh, and I don't know if anyone is doing that work, but I think it would be really interesting to look at if that, uh, if, if as many companies and projects are taking advantage of that as we hope are doing it, that, like, the remote anywhere, like, to see if that makes a real impact on their marketing. Yeah, I mean, I haven't looked at it from a company perspective, but some of the analysis that I've done on Kernel looking at how people work together, so whether or not two people kind of work together on the mailing list. Um, in terms of that location, it really doesn't matter, at least in the, the subset. So I, I looked at the PCI subsystem. And looking at that, it doesn't, location doesn't appear to actually have much influence. And you don't tend to work more closely with people in your same time zone, for example. So it doesn't. So you're not missing out on full remote. Doesn't seem that way. Yeah. Based on, you know, I mean, it's a specific segment of the Linux kernel, so it's very not, may not translate to every project everywhere, but it's a data point, anyways. Uh, so, when it comes to maintaining diversity in your projects and your companies, 
there are a lot of ways that people will disengage silently, but if they feel threatened, like, say there's a lot of sexist behavior in the office, that the women will tend to just leave and not come back. So people just leave without saying anything about it. Are there any metrics to track that and counteract it? I know it's hard to attract someone that just stops showing up. But <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a true statement. I'm like, that is like a big mm-hmm. That's a true statement. I mean, there are conceptual metrics. If you do the gender of a person, um, and you yeah. just track the gender, oh. and you pick the, the life cycle of a participant in your project, and if there's a significant difference between people that have different genders, then that might be a, be a conceptual metric that would be useful for identifying the prospect that that's happening. So like um, your average male contributor contributes for like a year and then your average female contributor contributes for like six months sort of thing? Or two full requests and they're out. All right. I mean, it's usually faster than that. Right. Okay. I think that instead of focusing on gender or something like that, you can focus on values. But then if you see a certain partner like the one you described, you can use metrics to filter that now and say, here, maybe it's not related to gender or age, but I can look at the person and then I can realize why well, it's a problem. But for sure, there is a problem there because the pattern can change so often and change for the most. And that's something you can factor in. We're really investing a lot in quality. We're doing research around this right now, so we're interviewing, coincidentally, doing a lot of interviewing people, volunteers who are in caregiving roles. We're also looking at like forms, so kind of like manually because um, doing looking at who's forms and left kind of thing. Who might also be a technical non-band contributor, which I have to evaluate through the name. It's totally uh, sucks, but we're trying to like and then reaching out to people to learn more. And also we're doing basically a user testing version of like, asking people to go through contribute to a project. We make sure they have all like their environment. Um, the technology they need, and then we're asking them to attempt to contribute to a project. So, you know, talking us through what that means, and um, we're trying to do it in an hour and a half so that it's like time sensitive to people. So we're still in the learning phase of that, but um, and I think that's the quality. I don't think we'll get to the metrics numbers. We'll still be identified better through the quality you know, what people are experiencing. That's the one more time. Yeah. My question here is, is the field a little too risky? What do I mean? Um, for example, I was looking at Stack Overflow. I was looking, I wanted to see gender by tag. And for that, I used the first name, which is not a good measure, but I was still getting good results. Like looking at gender by name, then by tag. Then you can look at how each tag is different and how, how each tag is changing through time. What languages attract uh, more diversity, at least gender wise. But then when I wanted to publish, a lot of people were like, you know what? Maybe don't. Maybe don't get into the topic. Maybe look at time zones instead. Look at what it says. Time zones. I don't know, something safer. So, uh, I can tell you the story of the first time we talked about the first the chaos project which the, the discussion was almost entirely about organizational diversity. How many different companies do we have contributing? And there was no presence of these, these larger issues of gender diversity or other kinds of diversity at all. And I think it's been Emma's work and Daniel's work, you know, Turgia, that have sort of made that visible to us. So in this community, absolutely, yes, I've seen that reticence to actually tackle this issue. It's, uh, in some respects, it's a, it's such a hard issue to talk about, and it's such a hard issue to talk about in the open source community for whatever reason, that uh, that counsel that you've got doesn't shock me. And I think, I think finding ways to talk about the phenomena that we can all observe and sort of face validate is, is a part of it. So maybe part, maybe all this panel contributes is making it just a little bit easier to have the topic you know, diversity and inclusion is one of those really sensitive topics that if I measure it, then I might have to admit how terrible I'm doing at it, 
you know, despite how much I, you know, so it's something I'm incredibly passionate about, and it's something I think I care deeply about. Um, but I haven't always gotten it right, right? I've ended up with, with puppet camps that I selected the talks that ended up not having a very diverse set of people. And, you know, you, you look at that and you measure it, and you're sort of ashamed by what you find, and that's always uncomfortable. I, I was going to just add to the. I think it'd be interesting to bring the cast group those sorts of challenges you're hearing because I think as a group and working across projects is so important. How can we help you answer those questions? How can we like flag them as valid questions? Like for example, if someone said to you, I don't think you should be releasing this data because it might expose people visually. Like you, you've got for example transgender identity and there's only we all there's two people that we know who they are and this might expose them, like what time zone they're in, when they're working, like people are do we use the data for weaponizing and so that would be a valid challenge, and I think we should take it to the black folks. So, so yeah, the, the immediate reaction if you're asked to measure gender and diversity or diversity and inclusion in the community that's not terribly diverse or inclusive historically is will this data be used against me? Is it going to be weaponized? And I think, and then uh, that's, I've heard that term periodically. And it, if you think about the history of any metric that's been some respect, I mean, I think many of us have an experience where we've had a boss or a supervisor or an organization that took some metric that wasn't really a proxy for performance and sort of took it to the bank over and over again in ways that, that were, in some sense, weaponizing, in other senses, just not reasonable approximations of what we are accomplishing. And it, I think any metric that we produce, uh, somebody can quote unquote weaponize it. I can weaponize commits. In fact, I'd argue that commits is probably the most weaponized metric in the open source community. So there's really nothing that's going to hurt any of us, in my opinion, by measuring diversity and inclusion. I mean, honestly, if we measure it now, it's only going to get better. So, yeah. <laughs> my question is really quick is maybe this risky event, we need, uh, we need good research in this because right now there are a lot of opinions and very little facts. And that means that any discussion becomes emotional because people don't have facts to work with. And we need very good research in it. And it's not easy to do us, as you said, because there are many things involved, from privacy to how are you sure that you are measuring the right thing, for instance. But getting those facts is fundamental to start looking for solutions because right now we don't really know in many cases where the problem is exactly on how to track it. I have one more thing to say that the cool thing I think to say is cool is that working group is because we work with academics, they're challenging us on what is your source of research, right? Which I very much like to do. So I have one more thing. So I'm intrigued in the
a benefit, I think, in, in um, developing the actual like quantitative measures that you always have that human base to it. So you start with a qualitative base and then yeah. those meta metrics become the quantitative. I think so. I think that's just what I'm sure will be course corrected a few times, but yeah. experience like people very quietly leave, there's usually then explicit complaints beforehand about the tracking it all for our organization, like the open source project in itself's organizational response to complaints and tracking. Are there metrics to, to track response and the effectiveness of certain responses? Can you give an example of response? Like, can you give my response? I think I know my response. So the project's response to, let's say someone does Let's say they're having an issue, right? Uh, that would fall under this category. Are there metrics to track what the response of the organization is when something actually is reported? Just isn't either. Is that considered the response to an issue? So you're talking about the Yeah, like let's say let's say you're having an issue in the first project. Been harassed or attacked yes. or something, right? Do we track? Is there any metric or documents to that? How the community responds to this toxic event? Yeah. I mean, moving closer towards like actionable solutions to that, you know, right now we're documenting is, is there a problem with diversity, right? But eventually you would want to get to, okay, we're putting in these protections, those protections get implemented, you know, actions happen. Um, are we tracking that part now? Yeah, so um, I can speak a little bit on behalf of Lissola because we really, and also Chaos, and also we did a survey of 240 um, projects this year, talked about code conduct. We found that, I forget the exact numbers, but obviously it's in a range, um, that 45% of people in open source communities did not feel the code of conduct really influenced whether they felt safe or empowered. So, like, there was some stimulus code of conduct up in the repository going, we've got that covered, right? Um, and so we're starting to like build processes and measure people's sentiment around uh, that, and also effective enforcement, like tracking and response, and not seeing like how long people on uh, like, working groups and racing for decision making. Like we've got a whole framework we're building, and I think within the Chaos Project Group, I'm, I'm trying to bring a lot of those kind of measurements to put a report on it. enforcement.
how it's kind of done uh, and, and how it's how it's kind of going to be kind of taken out and used. So is it like separated from the uh, from the whole? So, so if you if you look up some of these on uh, on the, the metrics, uh, would you be able to find their uh, main connections there? Like get how to do things and stuff like that. I just think for peace of mind, I would want to find my like, gender kind of yeah. Yeah. Yeah, This is a bit right there, but you can still put a home for the step. So in some cases, you won't be happy to identify it, but you don't want to bring in the white individuals. Then, as you go, you know, we do an analysis before of gender, for instance. And then, based on that, you kind of measure the data, you look at the differences. You look at how long does it take to get to a set of progress for big and then the data that you get is segregated, and the results are important because you can find out whether there is a difference or not, or whether the rate is improving or not, for instance. And that's the most useful thing because it doesn't involve privacy. Then you have a second case, which is where maybe you are interested in finding out a specific situation. Like it was said before, a specific pattern of a person that maybe is living because he's a caregiver and he's having a, a, a special pattern of individuals. Uh, that's pretty specific. My impression is you need the consent of both the three and the person who's doing that. Because in that case, you are basically targeting a person. And maybe the person, even if you are trying to help or something, doesn't want that. And that's pretty specific. Yeah. But for the, for the first case, you can do a lot of things. And you can uh, characterize the communities without going to privacy issues, basically. Because once you know the, the, the item that you want, you can revise everything. You also have to be you also have to be pretty careful about how you anonymize things and how much information you give because you know I, I read research papers, um, academic research papers, they're talking about a specific project, they'll talk about, you know, somebody's a you know maintainer and they say enough stuff that even though they don't mention the name, I know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, and can pretty easily tie that back because in a lot of cases there aren't a lot of people who match a specific category. And that was one of the things I had to push back on my a lot of my PhD research because they were like, no, you need a table with like, you know, this person, the, the gender, the, you know, and match everything out. But I said, if, if I do that, people are going to be able to identify specifically the three women that I interviewed because there aren't that many women who contribute to the Linux kernel. And if I talk about, you know, specific demographics, it's going to be really easy to guess who those, who those people are and tie them back to quotes, which, you know, depending on the sensitivity of what you're working on, even when you think you've anonymized it, you may not. From a scientific point of view, that's a big problem because it's really difficult to serve the users. If I do some research with some data set, even if I try to anonymize it and I publish it, if somebody wants to really like it and they anonymize it with the original data. And that means that basically the anonymization renders to not So it's very difficult to serve and therefore to do replicable research, which is basically this. So it's, it's a big problem. There are tools like genderize.io. Take a name and derive gender identity. Which is heaven. It's a thing. It's a thing. I mean, and people are you know trying to figure it out. It's it's difficult. I mean, in the end, you have an idea. But for instance, my name is Jesus Maria. So think, I'm male. <laughs> So, because you, you, know, you need to know the culture, you need to know that in Spanish, you only Maria is the second name, that's Spain. If it is the first name, it's female. But genderized friends don't go to that. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's tricky. The other game is comparison. That's cool. Sorry. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, from a name point of view, if you look at all Asian names, all East Asian names, that's going to be very difficult if you're a male or female. Uh, but uh, the thing I wanted to mention here was about the time zone as a means to uh, measure uh, contributions. Uh, I have you know, tried to figure out this for a very long time, and the biggest challenge I have is contributors from China. They will almost always, unless they are with uh, Alibaba or, you know, or Huawei or someone like that, they almost always change the time zone because they don't want to be seen coming from UTC plus 8. Okay, so they will change it to European time zones or North American time zones. So almost always. So when I see UTC plus eight, it's either from Southeast Asia, who went around from Singapore, or from Perth and Australia. Australia is you know, UTC plus eight, nine, ten. 
uh, but very few UGC plus 8 comes from China, unless they are with a corporate entity. So how do you measure that part of the story with as far as using time zones as a as a metric, as a, as a kind of a divider? It failed for me in measuring uh, contribution to China. You cannot tell Europe or Africa. Sure. Name is one problem, and then time zone is, a, is a actual a real problem. So, for instance, in that case, I have experience with uh, the you know, top people in TMT show, which is basically uh, uh, UK, but you see that they don't change time somewhere, which means they are not really in the UK. So, my, my guess is that many of them are Chinese that they have changed to UTC zero. That's it. So one thing I noticed also that uh, you could, I mean, I kind of inferred that this was coming from China by looking at when was it actually submitted, or it was UTC plus four. Uh, but that was, you know, at that time, really somebody at that time was doing some stuff, chances are not. So I had to then infer trying to figure out, oh, actually this guy was awake at you know, UTC plus eight, or something like that. So uh, you have to infer from, from looking at it to see where it was really funny. 